Good morning, everyone. My name is Yuli Willemsen, and I'm a senior research fellow here at the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs. Welcome to this uh, seminar on the upcoming Georgian elections and what implications they may have for Georgia's foreign policy orientation. Uh, this seminar is a part of the GeoPath project at uh, NUPI, <clears throat> which uh, NUPI conducts together with the Georgian Institute of Politics. And welcome especially to the audience uh, out there. Uh, we would like to just inform you that this uh, seminar will be streamed on YouTube and also that you can join and take part with questions. So we encourage you to send your questions in the chat uh, as we go along and then we will hopefully get time to to address them. Uh, for many in our Norwegian audience, uh, Georgia is a place we associate with hospitality, good food, beautiful nature, etc. And on Georgian fo foreign policy, we would know that Georgia is the country which is aspiring to become a part of the West, uh, become members of the EU and NATO, but also that Georgia is a post-Soviet country and borders on uh, Russia. A Russia which has uh, increasingly uh, views itself as a patron uh, of this region and as in competition with the West in this region. So I think sometimes we have a tendency to look at Georgia simply as one of the countries in between. So this seminar is an effort to uh, give Georgia some agency back, so to speak, um, <clears throat> and look at how Georgian foreign policy orientation is shaped from within. Uh, and on this crush course, uh, and we have, I think, the optimal speaker, namely Professor Koneli Kakacha, who is with us uh, from Tbilisi. He is a professor at the Tbilisi State University, as well as the director of the uh, Georgian Institute of Politics. So welcome, uh, Koneli. Good morning. It's nice to be here. Great. Uh, so I think we'll just um, start off with the simple question, who in Georgia has the power to, to shape Georgian fo foreign policy? And I think it would be interesting to know both formally who has the power uh, and in reality and, and uh, why, how important is uh, foreign policy uh, in terms of the, the upcoming parliamentary election? Uh, I think uh, uh, if we start uh, about the uh, who is the uh, I'll say the leading the um, uh, Georgian foreign policy, we should probably name the executive branch uh, of the government, uh, which was uh, always leading Georgian foreign policy last I would say uh, 25 years. But as you know, after constitutional changes, recent constitutional changes things supposed to change, and especially after this election, because Georgia moves towards parliamentary uh, system, uh, which may and uh, in actually should change the for, uh, foreign policy uh, planning as well. So there should be more involvement and more, uh, how to say, uh, supervision from the parliament. Um, there's a lot of discussion whether Georgian parliament is ready for this, uh, but that's uh, another issue. But in general, I think we are moving to that direction. As of today, I think the Georgian foreign policy is uh, driven by executive and, of course, uh, some ministers like Foreign uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, and Prime Minister's Office uh, and, uh, of course, the uh, parliament, the chairman of the parliament and uh, some other, you know, like um, parliamentary committees are quite involved. This is as far as the formal, uh, but as far, to, as far as the informal uh, influences, Probably you know that um, in Georgia, like in other uh, Eastern European countries, um, uh, I mean, the challenge is that in other Eastern European countries, they have um, few oli uh, several oligarchs. In Georgia, we have only one, 
and as you know, he's the chairman, uh, officially chairman of the ruling party. So I think he is, is may not be um, directly involved in all this foreign policy decision making, but I think he's shaping the rhetoric. And we know that when he came to the power, you know, uh, he uh, made several uh, important statements, which actually is still uh, considered to be the, um, how to say, the important, um, um, I would say, um, you know, like uh, directions for Georgian foreign policy. Namely, he said that when he came to the power in Georgian dream and Bidina Ivanishvili, um, who was the leader of that um, actually party, he said that we don't, unlike the previous government, we don't want to see the Georgia, uh, you know, uh, to be squeezed between West and East. And we also want to start a normalization policy of uh, with Russia. And um, so basically there was some change of the rhetorics uh, towards Russia as well as uh, generally, I think the vision of the Georgian dream is a little bit different than uh, from previous administration of Mikhail Saakashvili. I cannot hear you. In, in Norway, uh, which is an interesting comparison with, comparison with Georgia, because we're a small country, we have um, a so-called consensus culture on foreign policy. And this is a culture which is highly protected and maybe increasingly so with reference uh, to the argument that since we're so small, we have to agree, we have to stick together on, a foreign, on the foreign policy orientation uh, in particular. Uh, so, do you have that kind of culture uh, in Georgia? I think, in general, it's a very difficult question. But I would say, in um, in uh, on issues related to foreign policy, we have more consensus than anywhere else. Uh, of course, there's uh, some uh, strategic agreement in on, on strategy. There is agreement between, uh, for instance, ruling party and opposition political uh, parties or civil society. But of course, there is differences on the tactics or how to implement that uh, things. As you know, Georgia is a um, member, uh, one of the front runners of Eastern Partnership, um, you know, the initiative. And Georgia is um, actually also has ambitions, as you mentioned, uh, to join European Union one day uh, or in the NATO. For for because of that, um, you know, I think this consensus is very important. Uh, but of course, there's some uh, differences uh, between um, different political actors. How they see, how they see the, mm, you know, the Georgia's integration, and also in time frame. But uh, in general, I would say, if you look the public opinion polls, including IRI, NDI, and CRRC polls, you see that most of the Georgians actually support the Euro-Atlantic integration of Georgia, and that's a quite high number. Uh, more than 70% is support NATO membership, and then more than 80% actually supports European um, Union membership. And uh, of course, this would not be possible without uh, you know high consensus uh, on that subject. Of course, there are some challenges because uh, recently we also hear some Eurosceptic voices and there are some political parties um, uh, in the parliament and also outside of parliament who actually try to change this discourse. And uh, uh, of course, this is a, like a music uh, for, the, uh, for the years of the Moscow and Kremlin because they actually want to hear more and more skeptical voices uh, from Georgia. Because as you know, after 2008 war, uh, Russia lost direct influence on Georgian politics. So they are now trying somehow to gain that influence on foreign policy, which is not easy. Unlike in, for instance, in Moldova or uh, some other countries where there is a discussion, you know, which one is better for uh, EAP countries like Moldova uh, to join the Eurasian Union, Russian-led Eurasian Union, or to join European Union. In Georgia, we don't have that discussion. There's only discussion when and how and uh, in uh, um, uh, to join um, European Union or NATO, even though we understand that this is not a, um, you know, immediate, uh, I said, opportunities, and there's an understanding, but uh, I think uh, there's a quite strong consensus on that. Mm. What we see in some European countries now is actually a divergence between uh, uh, the, the population. Uh, what the population thinks uh, should be a different European countries' foreign policy orientation and the elite, uh, also including the, the parliamentarians. Uh, is there that kind of split uh, in Georgia? 
Uh, I will. I cannot say there's a split, but there's some differences. For instance, according to uh, different polls, what we can see is that there's a difference between elite discourses, uh, which is very pro-European, pro-Western, and uh, what the population actually wants. And uh, one of the differences that actually, which is, uh, I would say, mission impossible for the Georgian politics, uh, but this is what they actually, the society wants. They want to have a good relations with the European Union and NATO and to integrate with the EU, but at the same time have a good relations with Russia. In theory, it looks very nice and uh, it's actually what everybody wants, but in reality, I think it's not just depends on Georgia and uh, Georgian politicians because, um, as you know, in order to dance tango, there needs to be at least two partners. And when you miss another partner who doesn't uh, want to engage with you in this regard, I think it's very difficult. But Georgian society still wants uh, to have a good and working relations with Russia, even though we have a um, uh, very difficult situation. We don't have, as most of you probably remember, diplomatic relations between two countries, but Georgians also understand that Russia is our neighbor and it's a huge market for all, all neighbors, including Georgia. So I think this pragmatism uh, is still prevails among, uh, among the Georgian public. Uh, thank you. I would just uh, like to remind the audience that you can you can send in your uh, questions. So please do in the, in the chat. We're ready to uh, to pick them up. Uh, so I think we'll move on to um, the upcoming elections and try to uh, give a bit of a picture uh, of what the different contenders uh, what they would uh, work for. Uh, when they get a seat in the parliament. So does it really matter very much who, uh, in terms of Georgian, Georgia's foreign policy orientations, who, uh, who wins uh, these elections? How different are the views on Europeanization, alignment with the EU and NATO and so on? I know you've touched upon it already, but we want to know about specifically about the people who are moving into parliament. Sure. Um, as I uh, mentioned already, uh, there's a consensus regarding Euro uh, Atlantic integration uh, among the main players. A few years ago, actually, uh, the opposition political parties, as well as ruling party, they actually signed several documents where they actually stated that um, as well. But of course, there are some differences, as I said, in tactics. And uh, for instance, for a ruling Georgian Dream Party, which actually runs the country right now, uh, they still uh, support the Euro-Atlantic integration of Georgia, but at the same time for them, uh, I think um, they, are, they pursue more, I would say, pragmatic uh, foreign policy because they don't also want to annoy Russia and uh, they kind of care uh, what Russia would say uh, about this. So I think there's a huge difference in that sense between opposition, uh, opposition and former government officials uh, and the Georgian dream because uh, uh, most of the active opposition parties, they are very pro-Western, very pro-European and they um, I would say, I would not say they are anti-Russian, but they, they are more, how to say, um, um, really, uh, I mean, they are more, uh, they, they want to secure Georgia's security with Euro-Atlantic integration uh, as soon as possible. And uh, of course, um, uh, this, um, uh, they also understand that there might be um, some clashes about this uh, with Russia, but I think uh, they are more straightforward in the demand uh, to basically uh, uh, the Georgia should uh, be part of uh, West, uh, the Western European alliances and uh, NATO integration. Of course, in the, uh, there are some political forces, uh, as I said, I would say right-wing populist, as some parts of Europe and uh, other parts of the world, they also gaining momentum in Georgia, and this could be a challenge for Georgian foreign policy because um, uh, these political parties, actually, they don't openly say they are pro-Russian, but they basically bringing the same narrative which actually Moscow wants to hear in Georgia. For instance, they um, try to uh, to um, uh, to, uh, for, for instance, spoil the relations between uh, Georgia and Turkey or Georgia and Azerbaijan and uh, Turkey is uh, Georgia's number one uh, trading partner and uh, and uh, they also want uh, to, um, you know, South Kaun kind of downplay the Russians occupation of Georgian territory and uh, they basically trying to bring all these historical grievances towards, um, you know, other neighbors and they also bringing some sort of, you know, religion in the focus uh, 
uh, to somehow uh, use it for political gains. And as you know, we already have one political party, it's actually a party um, uh, in the parliament who actually, um, uh, you know, uh, managed uh, to have 5% last election. We don't know what will be the, um, you know, the uh, result for, for this kind of forces, but that's uh, definitely could be the challenge. Of course, I don't think that they will shape or they can influence directly Georgian foreign policy. I, I don't think that that's the case. But um, uh, you know, if uh, this right-wing uh, populist forces, they will gain more uh, seats in the Georgian parliament, uh, then uh, maybe they will try to split the uh, public opinion uh, regarding the Euro-Atlantic integration. And I think that could be the, one of the challenges uh, uh, for the upcoming elections. Um, I would like to uh, to just move uh, move back to uh, to uh, the word uh, Europeanization and your initial remarks that there is consensus on Europeanization. I think it would be interesting for our audience to know what are uh, what is the concrete content of Europeanization. What is it that uh, they agree upon uh, should be the next steps? Uh, towards what does it mean? What does it imply? Europeanization. Okay, um, I think if you look the, uh, to the map where Georgia actually is located, you will see that Georgia, uh, especially after the 2008 war with Russia, is quite uh, isolated. Georgia is not a member of any meaningful security organization. Georgia is not member of any post-Soviet, uh, you know, like organization like CSTO or uh, CIS or Eurasian Union. Jo Georgia simply doesn't want to be part of any post-Soviet structure which is dominated by Russia. And that's that's where we have a consensus. At the same time, if you look at the map, also if you go see the south, uh, Georgia is also very close to the Middle East. But for um, historical reasons, as well as some other reasons, Georgia cannot be part of that, uh, you know, even though historically it uh, was part of that region. And then uh, if you look around, uh, Georgia is a small state uh, with limited capability, cannot really how to say stand alone in terms of security, especially when you have uh, you know occupied territories in your territory. And Georgia's obvious choice is uh, to integrate with the European Union because uh, when when they see the examples of a small state in European Union, uh, especially like Belgium, Austria, and how these small states are protected in European Union, this is the model that Georgia wants to follow. And one of the examples, a good model for Georgia is the Baltic states. They they are uh, they serving as a good model for Georgia because they were post-Soviet states. And everybody uh, was saying uh, before they became member of NATO in the European Union that um, and, uh, you know these three countries would not have chances to join neither NATO nor the European Union. And uh, we, we just kind of hear the same rhetoric about Georgia right now, but we also see that uh, these countries actually, uh, they manage uh, to overcome. And of course, one of the important thing here was that they managed to uh, build a resilient society and uh, they also managed to build a strong uh, regional, um, I would say, alliance, uh, unlike in South Caucasus, where we have a little bit more challenges here. And so, uh, the, as, um, as Georgia also feels a lot of pressure from Russia, uh, Georgia cannot protect itself alone. So, uh, Georgia's answer to Russian uh, geopolitical pressure is more Europeanization. Basically, the more Russia pressures, the Georgia's answer is Europeanization because we cannot balance, uh, uh, you know, Russia militarily. So, I think so what that's you're saying, the, if, I, if I could just push you on this, uh, what you're saying is that Europeanization uh, primarily is uh, uh, a security uh, uh, orientation. Um, and uh, so that's very interesting because it, it, it would ring, it would look, uh, for me, my, I wouldn't associate that with the word. And then secondly, uh, so that's kind of a, uh, a negative incentive. So you want, Georgia wants to move away uh, from Russian influence. But what would you say is the kind of positive motivation uh, uh, for for Georgia in terms of becoming European? What does it what does it mean yeah, uh, in terms of oh, institutions yeah. or values or? Sure, you know? uh, sure. I think um, that's a major core reasons why Georgia wants to be part of the European Union and the West because 
at the end of the day, uh, Georgians decided they want to build a democratic society based on, um, uh, you know, like uh, European values. And I think that's what is actually counted. And it's also, there is a, some um, influence from um, from identity, because if you look at Georgian history, uh, in all history of Georgia is about how to protect um, itself uh, from, um, you know, how, how to protect Can you hear me? Uh, no, we lost you a couple of seconds there. Uh, okay, yeah. Uh, so, uh, what I wanted to say basically is that um, all Georgian history was re related how to protect its own identity and Christian identity and also to preserve its own independence. And I think uh, this is where uh, the European Union comes because uh, uh, Georgia as a small state actually wants to be part of this uh, democratic society and uh, especially young people, uh, they really care about this and uh, uh, we should not also forget there's a lot of uh, the Georgia signed association agreement with the EU together with Ukraine and uh, Moldova and I think um, a lot of uh, young Georgians actually they feel now more European because don't forget they are also involved in different uh, exchange programs like Erasmus Mundus uh, and some others and I have my uh, uh, several personal uh, you know, students who actually um, uh, had exchange program in Norway. So I think that this generation, what I would call Erasmus Mundus generation of Georgians, would definitely change the perception of Georgia in the European Union and vice versa. But before that, uh, of course, there's some groundwork should be needed. And jo what Georgia actually needs um, to do is just to implement uh, the association agreement, uh, which uh, which is in Georgian interest, not just the EU's interest. It's, it is what we committed, and of course to build the uh, you know democratic society uh, and resilience, uh, which is also important. And that's why I think th this uh, election is also very important in that sense because. Uh, you know, Georgia's ambition is very high, but at the same time, uh, Georgian political class and um, Georgian society also uh, need somehow to uh, prove that Georgia is not only aspiring democracy, but Georgia is trying to uh, move towards consolidated democracy. And I think, uh, uh, you know, this election will be kind of lacmus test for um, this and to see basically and uh, where Georgia actually is moving. Hmm. Yes, because that kind of brings me to the to the next question um, uh, to you as a scholar. Uh, what really do you think are the possibilities and constraints uh, constraints in Georgia's striving to be uh, a part of uh, Europe and and NATO? And of course, also considering that uh, Europe doesn't really or the EU doesn't really have a very strong defense component to offer Georgia. Exactly, that's a true. But one of the biggest problem uh, for Georgia is the and historically was uh, that's a geography. In, in one may argue actually that in 21st century, you know, when we have in a globalized world, if if that is, is this component still uh, important? But I would say I think yes. And if you look the neighborhood of Georgia, is uh, uh, you know it's it's also not in, uh, in uh, not. Uh, uh, Georgia doesn't have advantages here because, uh, um, you know, Georgia is located in uh, uh, Black Sea region and uh, all our neighbors, especially recently, they um, they have some sort of, uh, they turn more to uh, authoritarianism and that's a huge challenge for Georgia. And uh, there was even a question uh, last year we asked one, uh, we, we discussed one of our conferences that can Georgia actually survive and and has its own demo, uh, democracy and uh, can it make, uh, you know, like reforms when you have such an environment, when you are actually, um, how to say, your um, most of your neighbors actually moving in uh, absolutely another direction. Uh, and uh, I think uh, what the uh, biggest challenge also for Georgia is that Georgia doesn't have a um, uh, shared experience uh, with European nations. Of course, everybody uh, knows Georgia, uh, you know, and also on governmental levels, we have a good uh, relations, uh, bilateral as well as you Georgian relations. But what we lack is that we lack the, um, you know, uh, the experience and exchanges on societal level uh, from both sides. Basically, well, uh, for instance, sometimes Georgians 
the, they have some stereotypes about um, European Union or member states, and it's the same uh, you can say about EU member states, because there's not much knowledge about Georgian politics or internal you know, dynamics of the country. Uh, one example uh, could be um, uh, when there was a discussion um, in uh, Netherlands um, about the uh, association uh, agreement, approval of association agreement with um, Ukraine, and uh, suddenly, uh, for many Georgians, they were su surprised that you know Dutch uh, people actually voted against this. Um, this was a huge uh, blow for the, uh, many Georgians because uh, uh, they didn't understand the position of Netherlands because at one point uh, Netherlands is number one of the um, number one, uh, I would say, development partner for Georgia, uh, and at the same time. Uh, you know, uh, this position of uh, Netherlands not really well understood. So this is a, one of the good examples when we need a little bit more interaction on societal level. And it was not, um, you know, about, uh, you know, the, uh, that, you know, the Dutch people didn't like Ukrainians or Georgians or something. It, it, it was uh, basically the answer to some internal political situation, which we don't know. And it's also relates to internal party politics in EU member states. And I think we need a little bit more involvement from both sides to uh, to um, uh, to get a little bit closer. And I think in that sense, this is a huge challenge for Georgia. And uh, also, I think that, um, uh, uh, as you know, Georgians, we are not really well known for strategic patience. And our Western partners always emphasize the Georgian strategic patience, especially in terms of uh, NATO integration uh, and also EU integration. But uh, and of course, there's some differences um, and also appetite of the European Union, as you know, recently, uh, you know, a little bit changed, and there's no not so much uh, mood now for uh, for uh, enlargement or any this kind of talk. So in that sense, I think. Uh, uh, when there's a not really a clear perspective, European perspective for uh, countries like Georgia, Ukraine and Moldova, uh, uh, there's a very good, um, I would say, uh, maybe a role model for us could be uh, Norway in that sense that Norway is not officially a member of European Union, but it's actually uh, you know, uh, involved uh, in many e in European projects. So. I, I think for interim period, uh, the model of uh, Norway for Georgia could be very useful. How to integrate, uh, you know, like sectorally in European Union. I think this this is the what could be done uh, to be realistic, especially uh, when we um, have so many challenges now in European uh, Union, uh, which I don't want to uh, probably highlight right now. So uh, uh, let's move a bit uh, back to uh, Georgia's relations with um, uh, with Russia. Uh, I've been looking at uh, Russia's views of of Georgia, and in my readings of what has been happening the past maybe f uh, four or five years, is that the Georgian Dream uh, Party uh, has was initially uh, pursuing quite a pragmatic approach to uh, to Russia, but uh, less and less so. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering, uh, and maybe that's that might just be a Russian perception, but that's anyway what it looks like from the from the Russian side. So if we uh, think about these upcoming elections uh, and uh, we, we would like to know, uh, do you think there there will be uh, more of a push towards uh, um, pragmatic relations with Russia or or less of it? You already commented slightly, uh, but I would like to know maybe particular uh, parties, you know, uh, who, who would mm -hmm. uh, and who would openly uh, speak of these issues and what would it say in their programs, so to see. Yeah, I think a lot of these things will depend uh, what will be the uh, uh, you know, result of this election. If um, Georgian dream uh, uh, I mean, cannot have a majority in the parliament, then uh, I think that there might be slight changes in the foreign policy because if they need to somehow accommodate the interests of opposition, opposition parties, they are very pro-Western, pro-European, uh, and I think there could be some changes. But if they will manage to have, uh, you know, like um, government without any coalition, 
uh, which is, um, I would say, personally unlikely. And this is what actually Georgian society wants. Georgian society wants to have a multi-party democracy and not a single party dominant uh, parliament. And uh, I think, uh, yeah, a uh, lot of things will depend on this. Of course, uh, every uh, political party uh, in Georgia wants um, uh, to have a good relations with Russia. But the major issue here, including uh, ruling party and opposition party, is that it cannot be at the expense of Georgia's territorial integrity and sovereignty. And there we have some, uh, uh, you know, like differences between Russia and Georgia, because uh, Russia doesn't see the Georgian statehood project as a um, kind of, um, how to say, beneficial for its own geopolitical interest. And as you know, uh, Russia sees Georgia and other, uh, you know, post-Soviet countries, kind of its own backyard, and I think this is there's a huge difference is how they uh, actually both sides see the role of Georgia and the region generally in uh, in um, you know uh, in uh, regional politics, and of course there are uh, some emotional um, I would say uh, links as well, uh, and I, I think um, to be uh, to be more realistic. I don't think that we will solve uh, uh, these uh, problems in bilateral relations with Russia anytime soon because uh, things uh, got even more, how to say, uh, problematic after Russia recognized uh, the Abkhazia and South Ossetia as independent states. And I think in that sense, uh, Russia uh, doesn't know where, how how actually to improve these relations because of course there, there was some attempt to improve relations on economic level, cultural level and that was done uh, under the Georgian dream uh, government but they stuck at the end because uh, they know that there's a, they reach already some certain red lines where Georgia cannot uh, compromise and these red lines are territorial integrity and uh, sovereignty and uh, choice of foreign policy orientation, which is uh, uh, absolutely unacceptable for uh, Kremlin. And I think uh, this, these are the objective barriers uh, for improvement of relations between two countries. And it doesn't really make uh, much difference who is in uh, Georgian government, I mean, which political parties, because uh, I don't think that any political parties will cross this red line. And at the same time, what we see that Moscow is not ready to change uh, its foreign policy towards Russia, uh, towards its neighbors, including Ukraine and Georgia. Uh, and I don't think that in these um, circumstances we will see any meaningful breakthrough in bilateral relations. Hmm. No, I, I would uh, agree to that. Indeed, in my readings of, of uh, Russian discourse, uh, they are increasing, increasingly insisting that uh, Abkhazia and South Ossetia are independent states and of course the, the parallel to Kosovo is is drawn constantly and the claim that uh, this is kind of a new international practice now. So Kosovo got its independence and Ossetia and uh, South Ossetia and Abkhazia uh, have it according to the same line of reasoning which is today um, kind of normal uh, practice in, in the world. Uh, so I think we'll uh, take in a question from the audience here, which speaks to this uh, problem of uh, really a big issue between uh, Russia and Georgia, which seems somehow uh, insolvable. And the question is, in what way will the Russian occupation of Abkhazia and South Ossetia hinder a closer alignment with NATO and the EU? Are you hopeful of a solution to this conflict? I think we answered uh, the second question, but now we want to address the, uh, the first. Uh, what kind of concrete obstacle is it for closer alignment uh, uh, with NATO and the EU as long as these, um, this issue is not solved? Okay, let's start with um, NATO then. I think, um, as you know, Georgia is, I would say, is a de facto member of uh, NATO. Uh, when I say de facto, it means that Georgia actually fulfilled almost uh, most of the actually uh, formal and technical requirements uh, for NATO membership. Uh, but as you know, Georgia didn't got uh, 
uh, membership action plan, which is one of the criteria to become the member. And one of the, there are several reasons why Georgia, um, uh, you know, uh, could not get met. One of the reasons is political, uh, which there is no consensus among member states uh, to invite Georgia and Ukraine to to, uh, to NATO, even though they pledged in 2008 in Bucharest summit that these countries one day become member of NATO. But uh, one of the reasons is also uh, related to territorial integrity of this uh, Georgia, including occupied territories, because at the end of the day, um, uh, you know, a lot of member states, they're not sure if, even though they know that Georgia is one of the high contributor to uh, NATO security operations, they are not sure about if Georgia can be contributor for the stability of the uh, alliance. And that's um, one of the major question. And especially if you have two occupied territories where you have Russian troops and they're just 40 kilometers from Tbilisi, basically, um, you know, and especially in such an explosive region like uh, South Caucasus, where we have war right now going on between Azerbaijan and Armenia, of course, the you know uh, member states they think twice before they make decisions, and of course they also vary on the Russian position because and Russia actually misuses this uh, because they know that uh, the basically official Russian uh, line is that we will not accept uh, NATO membership uh, for any of our neighbors, uh, and uh, sometimes they forget that uh, and because they said that this is uh, about their own security and. Uh, but sometimes what is neglected, and here is very interesting uh, the uh, example of Norway, because uh, Norway is a member of NATO and it's also neighbor of uh, Russia, it's pretty much like Turkey in the, during Soviet time. And the uh, Soviet Union had a uh, NATO member country. So, but if you look to the, these countries, these, uh, the, these are the two, I would say, most stable uh, frontiers of Russian Federation. But I think they, they trying to somehow misuse it, and some, unfortunately, some, um, uh, you know, member states, uh, um, they, uh, they, uh, they are uncertain about the, uh, you know, advantages of Georgia. But at the same time, if you look the region also, Georgia has a lot of advantages. It's geopolitically very important country. It's very close to Iran and Middle East. Um, it's also, uh, you know, a hub of this energy corridor. Uh, which goes uh, from Central Asia to uh, to Europe, uh, and there's a lot of advantages. But I think uh, this, uh, you know, the territorial integrity of Georgia, which is challenged by Russia, is one of the huge problems. Of course, there are some other issues like uh, uh, Georgia is not really um, yet uh, consolidated democracy, and there's some lot of work needs to be done. But in general, I think uh, these are the issues which actually hampers, uh, uh, you know, Georgia's NATO integration. And of course, um, Georgia, uh, what Georgia needs to, to do right now, and this is my personal feeling, is that Georgia has to continue its own Euro Atlantic quest and uh, uh, including uh, membership, uh, you know, like uh, in NATO. And, uh, and Georgia has to prove that it's a reliable partner. And, uh, uh, and uh, also, there's a several scenarios, and probably some of you probably read that. Uh, one of them is um, voiced by Lukov uh, from Heritage Foundation. Uh, I mean, what could be the um, what could be the alternatives for Georgia's membership in NATO? And one of them actually is that uh, Georgia, the core Georgia, could join uh, NATO and without uh, basically covering uh, Abkhazia and South Ossetia until this conflict is not solved. Even though this is a compromise and um, uh, I, I would say a proposal. Uh, and uh, I think there's still uh, no consensus about this issue uh, right now. Uh, and there was also a lot of discussion, and uh, right now there's a lot of discussion about, uh, uh, you know, conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh. And probably you heard that there's some speculation that if uh, one day Russia will decide um, somehow to be, get involved in this conflict and to send the troops, uh, you know, they they may need a corridor, transport corridor, which is only through Georgia. And there was a lot of discussion what Georgia should be uh, should actually do in order to prevent that. And as you know, Georgia cannot, you know, like uh, stop the Russian troops alone. And I think uh, Georgia needs to work with European partners and uh, NATO partners somehow to make it, um, you know, like um, even in, in you know, its own geopolitical calculations, very costly for uh, for Russia to make. Uh, such a move, and I think this is um, this is one of the uh, I would say um, you, you can see with these examples 
how difficult uh, environment uh, to, um, uh, you know Georgia is trying to survive as a nation state. Yeah. Yeah, could we just uh, uh, return to uh, what should I call it, uh, Georgia proper's relation to the breakaway republics? Because after all, it's not all about Russia. <laughs> it's also sure. about the relation to these uh, ethnically distinct uh, republics uh, within Georgia. So we're interested in, are there different views on how to deal with uh, the occupied territories or South Ossetia and Abkhazia? among the political uh, contenders um, or those who want to, to have a seat in the parliament. Now, are there uh, different views on how to relate to and how to deal with all the challenges in connect, connection with the uh, breakaway republics? And then onto this, I would also like to just launch a question from the audience here. Uh, and this person says that in August, the leader of Alliance of Patriots made a controversial visit to Abkhazia. Would this party, if it will return to the parliament after the elections, be able to influence Tbilisi's approach to the secessionist conflicts? So that's a related, a related question. Yeah, yeah uh, I think an overall, I think uh, w uh, with major political actors, they have a consensus uh, and uh, the consensus is that there's nothing can be done at this moment because and I will explain you why we have this uh, such a con consensus um, among uh, civil society and political uh, uh, elites as well. Uh, because uh, I think this conflict which we have uh, in Georgia is uh, it has a three, three layers. One is the uh, uh, Georgian Abkhazian, Georgian Ossetian, and uh, that needs to be uh, addressed separately. And then you have Russian Georgian uh, conflict as well, which actually also makes it more difficult to have any breakthrough in this, uh, you know, bilateral talks between Georgian and Abkhaz and Georgian and Ossetians. And then uh, there's a three, third layer. Uh, which is recent, it's a geopolitical, uh, basically, where Georgia positions itself as a part of the West uh, and Russia sees it's a kind of proxy to the West and it even makes more difficult to, um, you know, like uh, uh, to solve these problems. And uh, uh, as you already um, mentioned, and, um, you know, uh, Russia is trying somehow to mimic the West uh, in terms of, for instance, West recognized the Kosovo. So they're trying now to build, uh, you know, this same case, uh, international politics. So they're trying to uh, um, uh, to use the same kind of thing. So in these circumstances, uh, and uh, and also the geopolitical environment is not really, how to say, um, George, uh, not for uh, good for, um, you know, like to start uh, some sort of breaking, um, you know, kind, kind of like for alternative solutions. And I think in order to to start uh, uh, to thinking about uh, how to solve this problem, we need at least to remove, um, you know, uh, at least two layers uh, from this conflict, uh, the international geopolitical, because even if Georgia decides to do something alone, if there's a, you know, uh, you know, conflict between uh, West and Russia, I think Georgia cannot do much because if there's no will from the from the Russia and same thing about the bilateral relation between uh, Georgia and Russia. Uh, of course, it's not a uh, lot of things is not only depending uh, on uh, uh, on this conflict, there's some, some other issues between Georgia and uh, Russia, but I think that's uh, that's why we have this uh, uh, difficulties to um, uh, get any kind of new vision um, how to solve this problem. Of course, uh, formally on a formal level, Georgian government unveiled several, you know, like uh, proposals, uh, you know, uh, towards occupied territories, but I, I don't think that uh, they will. Uh, uh, they will be implemented anytime soon, since there is a, neither party involved in the conflict is ready to uh, to compromise on anything. As far as the uh, you know this opposition political parties, uh, you know like in visit to Abkhazia, I, I think this is the one of the example um, uh, where we have political actors closely associated with Moscow 
uh, and a lot of Georgians suspect that they have some uh, actually political links to the Moscow because otherwise I don't think that any nor ordinary Georgian citizen and we speak here about the vice speaker of Georgian parliament who visited Abkhazia. I don't think that that's possible for anybody else without prior agreement with Moscow. And I think this is uh, just one of, uh, another example which I was saying earlier that Moscow is trying to to bring these uh, pro-Russian um, actors in Georgian politics to have influence or to split this public uh, consensus on Georgia's foreign policy orientation. And these kind of political forces, if they gain a momentum, they will try. But I think it will be very difficult because, uh, of course, they uh, they still may have some uh, seats in the parliament, but I don't think that um, at present, uh, it will be very difficult for uh, such political forces to change the foreign policy orientation of Georgia, which may not be uh, satisfactory for Russia, but that's what we have uh, right now, at least. So, so you're in a way saying that if there is any disagreement on how to deal with Abkhazia and South Ossetia, it would only be because uh, Russia is creating that disagreement. So there is there no kind of indigenous um, uh, root of, uh, of of the of the disagreement here. No, of course, as I mentioned, there's uh, of course uh, you know like issues which is related between uh, which I mentioned between Georgian and Abkhaz, uh, you know like societies and of course Ossetians. But uh, I think uh, in order to start uh, kind of, uh, you know, like a realistic, um, uh, how to say, uh, solutions for these problems, you need to remove at least these two, uh, two impediments to this. And uh, uh, of course, uh, and especially if you uh, if you look at the Georgian foreign policy orientation, I don't think that that's uh, realistic anytime soon because, uh, you know, for instance, there's a, uh, now, lot, we hear a lot of voices now in Russia uh, and among Russian uh, expert community that they basically uh, try to to bring new ideas um, uh, to uh, to make its own neighbors, uh, uh, you know, more like neutral countries. And uh, they speaking about the Finlandization of Eastern Partnership, for instance, and, uh, you know, about Ukraine and Georgia and Moldova. Uh, but I think in case of Georgia, it will not work, and uh, as well as in case of uh, Ukraine for uh, different reasons. Uh, but, uh, you know, what they're trying to uh, bring is that, um, I mean, this is not the official line of Kremlin, but sometimes you you can read it from a Russian experts close to Kremlin. Basically, the um, uh, strategy of Moscow is that if Georgia changes its foreign policy orientation suddenly, uh, and it will join Eurasian Union um, and, you know, CSTO and just, uh, you know, like abundance this, uh, you know, Western foreign policy, then maybe uh, Moscow can uh, start thinking um, to find some face of saving solution for Tbilisi. And uh, when you're asking uh, to this expert, what is this so-called face saving solution? And they say, of course, uh, you know, Russia is a great power, cannot take back the recognition of Abkhazia and South Ossetia, but what they can do, the under tutelage of Kremlin, they can, um, uh, you know, like establish new kind of confederation or federation uh, where, uh, you know, Abkhazia, uh, you know, Tsinwali region uh, will be again in Georgia, but this will be under the tutelage of uh, Eurasian Union. And then they talk about even return of IDPs and refugees because, uh, uh, as you know, uh, uh, Moscow sees the Eurasian Union pretty much uh, on the same level like European Union. So they say, you know, there will not be any impediments uh, uh, to, um, uh, for, to the citizens of this Eurasian Union to move wherever they want. So nobody will ask at the end of the day, uh, Abkhazians or Ossetians, if the Georgians who live, will live there uh, before the conference they will return. So, but the main major problem here is that uh, where uh, Moscow lacks the information uh, about the reality is that they don't understand that uh, it's not, uh, of course, uh, Georgia cares about territorial integrity and uh, that's a number one issue, but it's also about the values. Uh, and this is a very important because as I mentioned, uh, young generation of Georgians, they don't, um, uh, you know, for them, it's not possible to, 
uh, to live um, in the semi-autocratic, uh, you know, like environment like we have now in post-Soviet area, including Russia. So I think for these people, uh, European values is not just uh, words; it's 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 what they actually believe. And I think in that sense. Uh, this is where, um, uh, you know, the Russian strategists, they kind of miscalculate. They don't understand this local uh, circumstances because at the end of the, you know, uh, the people and especially young generation, they care about values. They care about democracy. They care about, uh, you know, uh, European integration. And I don't think that uh, this kind of, you know, like a, uh, strategies to bring Georgia uh, or Ukraine back to the uh, Russian fold is realistic. Uh, thank you. Uh, so we're uh, coming close uh, to the end of this uh, seminar. Um, so if you have any questions out there, please send them now. This is your last chance. And uh, the final theme which I wanted to return to and which the audience is also posing questions on is um, uh, the, the, the new war in Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, so I'll take the question from the audience instead of my own. It says, uh, how can the current situation in Nagorno-Karabakh influence Georgia, both in terms of uh, election and foreign policy? And what are the possible implications for NATO rapprochement? Yeah, I think um, this is very good questions, actually. Um, yes, of course, Georgia cares about what's going on in the region because uh, even though Georgia aspires uh, you know, uh, integration in European uh, Euro Atlantic space, it actually, uh, actually cares about the region. And as you know, uh, South Caucasus, unfortunately, unlike Baltic states, it's, it looks like today a more like failed region than a real region. Of course, in economic terms, uh, you know, cultural, historically, it was a region, but in political terms, unfortunately, it's a, uh, it's a failed region. Of course, uh, if there will be, um, uh, I think the, um, I'll, I'll just say, war, um, real war between Azerbaijan and Armenia, which we already see that how this is actually intensified, it has a repercussions on Georgia because uh, at the end of the day, we don't want uh, to see the, uh, Georgia is actually interested in stability of the region because uh, integration in Euro-Atlantic structures, you cannot uh, integrate if you don't have stable neighborhood. And uh, that's why Georgia is interested and Georgia is um, promotes itself as a neutral country. And this is where neutrality as a word is uh, uh, is acceptable for Georgians. They are neutral towards both uh, countries. Uh, Azerbaijan is strategic partner for Georgia and we have very close relations and also uh, with Armenia we have very close relations. So we are really interested to have a peace in that um, in our region. But uh, of, of course, uh, Georgia gets a lot of pressure from both sides. And don't forget that Georgia, uh, in Georgia, we have also uh, ethnic minorities, uh, Armenian and Azeri uh, minorities. And some um, political forces outside of Georgia, they try to influence on that, uh, you know, uh, on that um, minorities. And uh, they basically want to uh, export uh, this conflict in, uh, to Georgia, and which is unacceptable for Georgia, because Georgia should position itself as a, uh, you know, platform where the both sides can actually talk. Uh, and Georgia is not a great power; it cannot enforce uh, either Azerbaijan or, uh, you know, force uh, Azerbaijan or Armenia towards uh, to find solution. But Georgia can be platforms or venue where they uh, this kind of, you know, uh, talks can uh, have and. Uh, uh, historically, we always uh, played this kind of role, and I think Georgia is uh, ready. But as you see, uh, reality uh, we have a little bit uh, different because if the sides they are not ready, even the big power like Russia, uh, you know, Turkey or the Minsk group, they cannot, you know, force the sides so far. Uh, but I think. Um, in general, um, if uh, things go wrong, this will affect the Georgian security pretty much. Uh, as I mentioned, there, there's a lot of different, um, I would say, negative scenarios for Georgia. Uh, one of them also could be like uh, if there will be spillover of this conflict to Georgia, we may end up with a lot of uh, thousands of refugees from both countries. And uh, uh, it may also you know, involve some regional powers and it will be even more uh, I, this will be catastrophic for, for Georgia. So I, I hope that um, the things will not go in that direction. And uh, uh, I think uh, the best solution will be if the sites will find 
solution to this conflict and there will be a real sustainable ceasefire and Georgia will do its utmost to to help uh, to the both sides uh, to um, to find a common ground on that. Just shortly at the very end, so for uh, just the few next couple of weeks before the elections, can you see any concrete implications of the war? Uh, I don't think that it will directly, I mean, unless there will be, you know, like a huge regional you know, involvement like in Turkey and Russia involved, of course, this may affect the election, but as, as of today, I don't see that um, uh, there can be any direct link with the election and uh, what's going on in Karabakh. But uh, uh, again, uh, a lot of things that, that depends how the things will evolve in the future. OK, so thank you very, very much, Cornelia Kokacha. I know you're a busy man, so you need to run to your next appointment. And I would also like to thank the audience very much for joining us here from the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs. Have a good day, everybody. Cornelia. Thank you very much. Bye.